Okay, good afternoon. Um, welcome to this press briefing. My name is Benny Pizer. I'm the director of the Global Warming Policy Foundation. I will be chairing the press briefing, which is organized jointly by the Foreign Press Association and the GWPF. It's our second time that we've done this uh, joint briefing in the hope you get as much out of uh, today's um, guest as possible. Uh, Myron Ebel is the director of the Center for Energy and Environment at the Competitive Enterprise Institute in Washington. He was until recently the head of uh, President-elect Trump's transition team that oversaw the transition to the Environment uh, Protection Agency. This um, presidential transition has now ended uh, with Trump's inauguration on the 20th January and Myron uh, is no longer obviously uh, part of that team and is in fact no longer or is not a um, member of the Trump administration. Uh, he is basically going back to his think tank, a, an independent policy wonk doing think tank work and he will not uh, be part of the administration and obviously he's not speaking on behalf of uh, the administration. Nevertheless, we want to find out as much as we can uh, about what's actually happening because no one really knows what's happening and uh, we hope Myron knows a little bit more than we do from reading the papers. Um, Myron is visiting uh, London on his way to Brussels where he will give a keynote uh, address uh, at the so-called Blue Green Summit which is organized by the conservative parties in the, in the European Parliament. Um, and the seminar will discuss, and I quote, uh, how we can best improve our environment using uh, market mechanisms and private property. Now, we all know President Trump is not known to be a big fan of free markets, or um, so we think. So it will be interesting to see um, how his new approach, whatever it is, will impact on climate policy, both domestically and internationally, and energy uh, policy. Interestingly enough, we've seen already some green energy investors becoming part of the Trump team. Elon Musk joined Trump's team in recent days, uh, suggesting that Trump might be much more positive towards renewables than people think. Another question we will hope to hear from Myron. These are just a few of the questions I hope Myron will be able to address. Um, he'll give, speak for about five minutes, and then we'll have lots of questions. Over to you, Myron. Great. Thank you, Benny. Uh, I want to thank Benny Pizer and the Global Warming Policy Foundation and the Foreign Press Association for hosting this uh, event. And I'm Thank you all for coming. I'm sort of amazed to see so many people here, but I guess there's a great interest in what's going on in Washington. Uh, I, I think I, I bring a message of great hope uh, both to uh, the United States and to the world in terms of the changes that I think we can expect the Trump administration to bring on energy and environmental policy. Uh, let me uh, reiterate what Benny said, I uh, am not a part, I don't represent the Trump administration, I'm not a part of it, I don't serve in it. It was my privilege from early September until January 19th to head the uh, tr presidential transition team for the EPA. And we did produce, uh, as every agency or departmental team did, we did produce an action plan for the agency uh, which is essentially an advisory document for the new administration on what policies it should pursue and how it should pursue them. And in, in doing this, what, what the Trump transition did was to try to write departmental or agency plans to fulfill and implement every single one of the promises and commitments that Mr. Trump made as a candidate. So uh, I'm not going to uh, reveal any, this, this advisory document, the agency action plan, uh, is a confidential document, and I'm not going to reveal anything in it. 
but I can tell you what President Trump promised to do when he was a candidate. And on energy and the environment, there were a number of very uh, clear and sort of black and white promises. He said he will withdraw from the Paris Climate Agreement. He will defund UN climate programs. At the EPA, he will uh, essentially withdraw or repeal all of the Obama administration rules regarding uh, greenhouse gas emissions, including the so-called Clean Power Plan. He will undo the uh, President Obama's Climate Action Plan, which affects every single agency in the federal government. Uh, and there's a long list of other things that we can talk about when you ask questions, but then I want to say a word about energy policy. And so I think the first hopeful thing I have to say is to tell you that uh, I think uh, the United States has clearly, uh, will clearly change course on climate policy. And that's the first piece of good news. The second piece of good news is that President Trump, as a candidate, said that he wants to unleash American energy production. Now, of course, American oil and gas production as a result of the shale revolution has been increasing dramatically despite the best efforts of the Obama administration to limit it. Uh, luckily, uh, only 28% of the United States landmass is federally owned. That may shock you to know that it's that much, but uh, most, virtually all of the increase in oil and gas production through the shale, new shale technology uh, is, is on private land. Uh, on federal land and offshore, our oil and gas production has actually been going down. And of course, some of the rules that uh, the EPA has been trying to promulgate would further limit uh, production in, in, the, in the shale fields by regulating uh, uh, gas field methane emissions into the atmosphere. And there are some other things too, some fracking rules that they've been talking about. So uh, President Obama said in the campaign that he, he wants to make America the world's largest energy producer and to achieve a position of global dominance as an energy producer. Now, uh, why is this, this is obviously good for the United States, but why is it good for the world? Well, it's, it's, just, it, it's not only about energy policy, it's about strategy, get geopolitical strategy. By uh, becoming the world's major supplier of energy, the United States will reduce the influence of certain countries in the Middle East and of Russia. And so, uh, how is this going to happen? Well, it's going to happen because the United States has the world's largest reserves of fossil fuels. We have by far the world's largest reserves of coal. Uh, and we also have, uh, with, because of the shale revolution, have gigantic fields of natural gas and oil uh, that will make uh, the United States inevitably the world's largest producer of oil and gas. So I think those are two uh, very positive outcomes of the election, uh, and I expect uh, President Trump to uh, be very assiduous in keeping his promises, despite all of the uh, flack he's going to get from uh, his opponents. So I'll leave it at that. Thank you, Myron. Um, we've got roughly an hour, 50 minutes for, for questions. So if you could please uh, say your name and who you write for. Please. Uh, Nick Miller from the Sydney Morning Herald. Um, what contact have you had with uh, the, at the top level of the Trump administration? What did you have previously? And from that contact, what do you know about the uh, attitude, beliefs of, say, uh, President Trump and Steve Bannon on uh, climate change and man-made climate change? Uh, well, uh, I don't want to discuss uh, some confidential uh, contacts I've had, but I would just point out as, as an example that Steve Bannon, as the editor and publisher of Breitbart, when he created Breitbart London, one of the first people he hired was James Dellingpole. So that might tell you where Steve Bannon is on this issue. Okay. 
Hi, uh, Damien Carrington from The Guardian. Um, sort of a follow-up from that, it's just, um, I think that a lot of people have heard so many different things, you know, um, from President Trump before, now, during, about climate change. I'm just wondering, without you know, uh, going over any confidences, but just give us what, what you think his impression of climate change is. Is, is it being caused by human activity, and does it need, do emissions need to be cut rapidly? And then can I ask you one other question, which is, I think, talked about in other interviews, but it'd be interesting to hear it here, which is, um, there seems to be a difference between Trump and Rex Tillerson on the pulling out of the Paris Agreement. I'm just wondering what you think will happen there and whether that might affect America's political <coughs> in the world and maybe <coughs> industries at home like wind, solar, electric cars. Okay. Um, well, let me answer the second question first. Um, uh, Donald Trump was elected president uh, largely because he figured out and, and figured out that he supported policies that are very popular in the heartland of the United States, that are not those of the bicoastal elite. The people in New York and Washington and Boston and San Francisco and Los Angeles and Seattle who think that their lives and their jobs don't really require much energy. Uh, the people who don't live in the areas dominated by the bicoastal urban elite, uh, the people who dig up stuff, make stuff, and grow stuff for a living are the people who uh, realize the, uh, directly, have direct experience of the consequences of the policies that produce higher and higher energy prices. California has electric rates twice the national average and yet their California is lower than you are here and much lower than Germany. But uh, the Obama strategy was to try to turn all of the country into something resembling California or New York where energy prices are high and where there is no more, the energy intensive industries have disappeared and gone somewhere else. But the <coughs> fact is that people in California still need energy intensive goods. They've outsourced them all. Uh, and the question is, if you turn Indiana and Ohio and Michigan and uh, the, the, the heartland states into a replica of California, what, what is going to happen to the economy of those areas uh, when they aren't part of a financial center or a, a high-tech Silicon Valley or they don't have Hollywood? Uh, and who's going to produce those goods? Uh, the, the obvious answer is they will go to places in the world that still have low electric rates that have not adopted these energy rationing policies. So uh, Donald Trump won the election because he appealed to those people. And he actually, during the campaign, learned a lot from talking to them. So uh, his, his, uh, his mandate is pretty clear, and he knows who he got it from. So this is a long way of answering your question. If Rex Tillerson disagrees with the president, who's going to win that debate? Well, I don't know, but I, you know, the president was elected, and Rex Tillerson was appointed by the president. So I would guess that the, the president will be the, the odds-on favorite to win uh, any disagreement over climate policy. Now, I've forgotten your first question. It was just, um, you know, can you sort of, because, because Donald Trump said different things about climate change at different times. Mm -hmm. Obviously, you've been working in the administration recently, not any longer understand that. But so, you know, what's, what's your understanding of what he thinks about climate change? Is it caused by humans and do, do emissions need to be cut rapidly to avoid problems? Uh, well, I don't know what he thinks about climate change, but I know he, he is pretty clear that uh, the the problem or the crisis has been overblown and overstated. I mean, you know, he, he tends to do that too. He, he likes to exaggerate and then pull back and say he was making a joke or you have to understand that he was uh, exaggerating for a reason. But, you know, he said climate change, I think climate change is a hoax and then he, he pulled back on that. Uh, I don't think there's any doubt that he thinks that uh, global warming is not a crisis and does not require uh, drastic reductions and, and immediate reductions in greenhouse gas emissions. Gentlemen in the glasses, please. Yes, um, Ronan Kavanagh from Energy Intelligence. Um, what do you think can be, ter can be accomplished in terms of easing the regulatory burden, given the Supreme Court has ruled 
the EPA must regulate carbon and other greenhouse gases. And also, we've heard a lot about the US needing to maintain a seat at the international climate talks. And how, what that, might that mean if President Trump withdraws from the Paris Agreement? Um, well, first of all, Massachusetts versus EPA in 2007, the Supreme Court did not order the EPA to regulate greenhouse gas emissions. This, the decision said that the EPA under the Clean Air Act has the authority to regulate greenhouse gas emissions, which, by the way, was a, would be a total, was a total surprise to all the people who voted for the Clean Air Act and the Clean Air Act amendments of 1990, where it was stated on the floor in 1990, in both the House and the Senate, I believe, uh, that the 1990 amendments could not, uh, that the Clean Air Act could not be used to regulate greenhouse gas emissions. But the Supreme Court said, no, no, the, the Clean Air Act does give the EPA that authority, and therefore the EPA must determine whether the Clean Air Act is a suitable vehicle for regulating greenhouse gas emissions. So in 2009, the Obama administration made the endangerment finding, which inaugurated the, the, or started the ability to regulate greenhouse gas emissions. So the endangerment finding said that we find that greenhouse gas emissions endanger public health and safety. Uh, that can be undone. Uh, the, there are numerous grounds for believing it should be undone, and I hope that it will be undone. So the first thing is that Donald Trump as a candidate promised to scrap the uh, greenhouse gas emissions rules. Uh, he did not directly speak to uh, whether he would undo the endangerment finding. My own personal view is uh, that he should, that the EPA should uh, start the regulatory process to undo the uh, endangerment finding. Whether they will or not, I have no idea. Not maintaining a... Oh, a seat at the table. Trend. Well, you know, this is, you know, everybody involved in, uh, in uh, government and diplomacy, they, they always say, well, we have to have a seat at the table. I mean, and undoubtedly, everybody at the State Department wants to have a seat at every table. Uh, but, uh, you know, uh, uh, President Trump made it clear that the United States is going to withdraw from the Paris Climate Agreement. Now, whether the Framework Convention Secretariat and all the other countries want to continue to invite the United States to have a seat at the table, I, that's up to them. But I, I don't think that President Trump is really very concerned about that because uh, the people who elected him uh, in fact, would prefer not to have a seat at the table. Thanks, uh, Ed King from Climate Home. In, in terms of the endangerment finding that you, you talked about, do you have any sense about whether discussions are taking place right now about, um, about that? I mean, do you have any sense about that within the administration? And in terms of the Paris Agreement and UNFCCC, what's the kind of fastest timing that you know, the US, could, you think that the Trump administration could start the process of withdrawing from either of those? Because it sounds like you're a bit worried that there might be some pushback. Um, well, I don't think there are any discussions yet on this because uh, no one, a, a temporary team of people has ha, have, have entered every single department and agency of, of the government to take political control of it, including the EPA. But, uh, you know, there's only been one person who has been nominated to, uh, for, to a position at EPA, and that's the administra administrator, Scott Pruitt, is the nominee, and he has not been <coughs> confirmed yet. So because there's nobody there yet, it's going to be hard to have a discussion. Uh, so I don't know. I can't tell you the timing. It depends on how long it takes to get people into the, into the appointed positions. Uh, as far as uh, withdrawing from Paris, it strikes me that there are, uh, remember, there are two promises, withdraw from Paris and defund UN climate programs. And that includes the UN FCCC, including the Green Climate Fund, which uh, you know, President Obama unilaterally sent $500 million to uh, early last year and then sent 
another 500 million right before he left office uh, this month. Uh, even though Congress had appropriated no money. He just simply moved money around in State Department accounts. Uh, and one of the, uh, I just want to, this is sort of an aside, but one of the uh, uh, kind of uh, problem, one, one of the shocking things about that is that uh, President Obama and his administration are in violation of U.S. law. Public Law 103236, passed in 1993 by the Democratic Congress and signed into law by President Clinton, uh, states very clearly that the United <coughs> States is prohibited from funding the United Nations or any agency of the United Nations that accepts as a member any entity that lacks the internationally recognized attributes of statehood. That's a long way of saying Palestine. Palestine was accepted as a full member of the UNFCCC in March of last year. So since about March 16th or 17th of last year, it's been illegal for the United States to fund the UN Framework Convention, including the Green Climate Fund. So what is the, I mentioned you, James, by the way. You missed it. Sort of late. Yes, OK, sit down. Um, uh, the, um, there are three ways, I think. One is to withdraw, to announce that, the, that President Obama's signature is hereby withdrawn uh, on, from Paris, and then to <coughs> announce that we will no longer be funding the Framework Convention. Uh, the second is to uh, announce that, yes, indeed, it is a treaty, not an executive agreement, and to send it to the Senate for ratification. And of course, the Senate will not ratify it, so it will be dead and then also defund the Framework Convention. And the third is to withdraw from the Framework Convention itself. Now, my own personal viewpoint is that by far the cleanest uh, method is to withdraw from the Framework Convention because <coughs> if you withdraw from the Paris Agreement and defund the Framework Convention, how can you continue as a member if you're not paying your dues? So I, I, it seems to me that if we defund the Framework Convention, it's inevitable that we're going to withdraw from it. So I, I would say do it right now, but it may it may be down the line. Ben. Yeah, Ben Webster from the Times. Um, so just to be clear, are you convinced that Trump will withdraw the U.S. from the Paris Climate Agreement? And can you take us through uh, how quickly you think that will actually happen? There's been some debate about delaying tactics. Well, uh, I, you know, I'm not convinced of anything in the future. Predicting the future is a very dangerous game. And uh, I love the futurologists who make all sorts of predictions about the future, and then no one ever goes back and says, well, you were actually wrong 90% of the time, and they keep making predictions. So I, I'm not going to make a prediction. Uh, he could do it by executive order tomorrow, or he could wait and uh, do it as part of a, a larger package. Uh, he could. I mean, there, there are multiple ways, and I have no idea of the timing. Uh, I, it will occur in my view. Uh, but I don't know the timing. Tom. Hello, Tom Clark from Channel News with Good Morning um, I'm just reflecting though, listening to some of the things you're saying, that me and my colleagues in this room haven't spent much time speaking to people like yourselves and Global Warming Policy Foundation over recent years because nothing you have to say has any support in fact. And there's a lot of scientific research, a lot of politicians and policymakers who decided that what you have to offer is essentially meaningless in terms of where the planet should be going, where the economy should be going, where business should be going. Um, yet, here we are all now sitting in a room listening to you again. Yes. Uh, why do you think that is? Uh, well, elections are surprising things sometimes. Um, you know, I think that the rejection by the American people of what they're told by the bicoastal urban elite or what Frank Johnson coined uh, the term for London, the chattering classes, is not an isolated phenomenon. I think you saw it in the Brexit vote. Uh, the, the people of America have rejected the expertariat. And I think for good reason. 
because I think the expertariat have been wrong about one thing after another, including climate policy. One of the striking things uh, to me about the, the experts who, who suddenly, you know, the, the climate science community is a very small one, and yet everybody now wants to be a climate scientist because there's, you know, glamour, fame, funding, all kinds of, you know, academic promotion for being a climate scientist. Uh, but the climate science community is actually quite small, and yet I'm amazed by how many people now uh, speak authoritatively about the climate science and how many people uh, have become public policy experts on the basis of being scientists. So the, the expert class, it seems to me, is full of arrogance or hubris, and that the people, uh, at least in this election, have said we've had enough of that. And if you, if you think that uh, the science is settled, well, I agree to this extent. There is a consensus, and I'm sure everybody in, in, who's uh, familiar with climate science agrees with it. Uh, there are greenhouse gases. Uh, the amount, the level, the atmospheric concentration of greenhouse gases is increasing as a result of human activity. And all things being equal, there will be some warming in the climate. That's the consensus. Uh, but the people who promote the alarmist agenda have uh, claim that, the, that the, the, the entire consensus it goes much further. Well, let's look at the science. I'm sure many of you have seen this graph that John Christie prepared, where he took all of the uh, model predictions, and these are all these lines up here, and then he took the, the radio, uh, uh, the balloon, the radio sound data sets and the satellite data sets. And you see that there is an increasing gap between the facts, the reality of the temp global temperature and the model predictions. So uh, if there is a claim that uh, the, the climate is, is in imminent crisis, it's based on model predictions which the facts are proving to be untrue. So, uh, and I think if you look at the impact chapters in the various IPCC assessment reports, you will see that the impacts, the possible impacts of climate change have been, uh, are not supported by most of the science. That there is a, there's a pretty strong consensus that the impacts are modest. Uh, and so far, of course, the impacts are beneficial. Uh, world food production continues to go up every year. And let me just finish with one final little fact. For those people who say that, well, yeah, there's been, there's been a, a slow, there hasn't been much warming for the last 20 years, or really statistically no warming for the last 20 years. But it's going to happen because we keep pumping more carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. Since 1996, that is the year before the Kyoto Protocol was negotiated, Thir over 30% of the total greenhouse gas emissions since the era of fossil fuels began in around 1750 have been emitted. Now, if, if we were going to have some warming, we should have, it should have started. I mean, the, the fact is that the sensitivity to, the, to uh, carbon dioxide or to greenhouse gas emissions, the sensitivity of the climate, has been vastly exaggerated. And the final point I'd make is, that in all of this discussion of the impacts of global warming, the benefits of higher carbon dioxide levels are, and, and of warming, uh, there are direct benefits of carbon dioxide and there are indirect benefits, ha are completely minimized uh, by, the, uh, by the alarmist community. Hi, Jessica Shankleman from Bloomberg News. Um, I wanted to ask a little bit about clean energy. So we've heard um, China this year, China's president giving an impassioned speech on the need for globalization. <coughs> and they said that they remained committed to tackling climate change and investing in clean energy, despite whatever happens in the US. Um, and we're seeing, you know, aside from the climate argument that clean energy costs are falling steeply, solar is expected to be cheaper than coal within 10 years. So. Um, what I wanted to know is whether there was concern within the Trump administration that they could lose out on that battle with China 
in investing in clean energy because as you said the US wants to be the world's biggest energy pr producer and clean energy is, is the fastest growing source of, of energy. Yes, I, uh, <coughs> someone sent me a letter that appeared in the, uh, I guess it's the Glasgow Herald that said on January 22nd a total of 0.889% of uh, the UK's electricity production came from renewable sources on January 22nd. So, uh, so for renewables to become uh, a, a dominant, it, we've got a long ways to go. Because on some days it might be 8.9 percent, but on some days it's 0.89 percent. Yeah, I'm asking so, about the U.S. and China. I'm not asking yeah. Okay. Well, China. You know, I. You know, first of all, we know that we have to take with what political leaders and politicians say. We have to take it somewhat skeptically. Uh, I think this is particularly true with the Chinese because they play a deep game in dealing with the West. And one of the things is they say things and then they don't do them. Uh, China is making big investments in producing more solar panels and windmills, which they sell to gullible consumers in the Western world so that our electricity prices will become higher and that they, the Chinese economy will become more competitive with those places that have higher energy prices. And so they're happy to supply us with all the windmills and solar panels that we want. Uh, on the other hand, if you look at their commitment under the Paris Treaty, uh, they, all they promised is a sort of intention to peak their emissions at what, what year did they peak? 20, in the 30s. In the 2030s. <coughs> so at least uh, 12, 13 years from now. Uh, and, and as far as I know, yes, they're putting up windmills, but they're also building a lot of coal-fired power plants. But I don't really feel that like you've answered my question. Um, because what I want to know is, is there concern in the Trump administration that there's a lot of investment going into China in clean energy, and the US is going to miss out on that if it doesn't I can't imagine on what what would concern people about that. I mean, I. Well, I'm, Texas is full of winter. Well, Texas has some very windy places, and they built a lot of wind turbines. But uh, has has that has that has that made the U.S. more competitive to have more windmills? No, it's made the U.S. less competitive. Solar energy is the future that people think. Oh, please tell us who you are. Evelyn of Finnish Broadcast. Mm -hmm. I just wonder that there's no point in speaking about windmills when solar energy is the one that people think has a real future. Well, uh, solar energy may have a real future in places where the sun shines 24 hours a day um, and in bright light. Arizona is a good place, at least for in this large parts of the year, for 15 hours a day, but uh, I don't think northern Europe is. Uh, you know. But we're talking about US, US energy policy here. So yeah, well, Arizona look, so, so, so solar right? panels aren't going to make it in Portland, Oregon, or Boston, Massachusetts. The sun just doesn't shine enough. So I've got solar panels in my house. I'm yeah, saying, yeah but, but yes, Come but on. Let, let, me, let me explain why put people. I'm sorry, guys. Why, why do people put solar panels on their house? Because they have a huge government subsidy to do so. Myron, let me, let me go deeper to this question because I think there is a point. Um, but Benny, can what, I have a follow-up on this, on this same issue? Is yeah, that, 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 that's my question. That's my question. My impression is, given that Elon Musk is already going in that direction, that <clears throat> Trump might actually appease the green lobby by doing both, going full on fossil fuels, coal, gas, and, and oil, giving them more incentives to open up and drill, and to continue with the renewable subsidies just to make the Greens happy. Yeah. Is that a realistic prospect? Uh, well, I don't know. I would say it, it is worth looking at this great capitalist entrepreneur, Elon Musk, who is one of the largest recipients of federal taxpayer subsidies in, in probably in the history of the world. Um, so. Um, certainly in the history of the United States. I, I think, um, look, the Congress has 
There's significant support for several subsidies in Congress. One is for ethanol. Uh, we don't have a subsidy anymore, but we have a federal mandate. On wind and solar, we don't have a federal mandate, but 29 states have renewable electricity standards, and those are supported by a federal subsidy. In December of 2015, the Congress renewed the wind and solar subsidies, but did so uh, with a plan to make them uh, to have them decline every year, starting I think this year or next year, so that wind within a few years goes down to zero and solar goes down to I forget 20 percent or 40 percent of its current rate. Uh, so, uh, and don't take me, I, I, I may have the numbers wrong, but anyway, Congress wants the subsidies to go down, and they, they, they enacted a schedule for that. So, uh, if President Trump wants to uh, continue those subsidies, he's going to have to go back to Congress and get them, get them changed. So, uh, you know, that, he could do that, but it will be a real fight because uh, a very large number of, uh, of uh, a lar very many members of Congress now understand the costs of these subsidies because the subsidies not only cost taxpayers, but then once you build the windmills and the solar panels, the result is not to lower the price of electricity, it's to lower the price of wind and solar produced electricity. And the result of that is that you have higher electric rates. So it's a very peculiar subsidy that ends up with higher costs to consumers that, that the taxpayers fund. And of course, taxpayers and consumers tend to be sort of, uh, they're, they're closely identified. Yes, uh, and then the next. Uh, Johnny Besto, Energy Life News. And I was wondering, uh, following Brexit, as the UK looks to become closer to the US, uh, how could Trump's policies have a knock-on effect to our energy policies? Well, mm, that's a very big question. I'm not sure I'm prepared to give a very good answer to it. Um, I, I, I think that, um, the, uh, that Brexit offers an opportunity for Britain to uh, expand its markets uh, around the world and to uh, increase economic activity and to, uh, and to lower the cost of production by getting rid of some of the European Union's uh, incredible uh, layers of regulation of, of, of business activity. Uh, but of course, the, the Trump, uh, President Trump uh, is, you know, sounds an awful lot like an old-fashioned protectionist. And uh, uh, I, I have to say, uh, working for the Competitive Enterprise Institute, we're relentlessly free trade as well as free market. So. Uh, I, I worry about the, the, uh, the trade policies that he has talked about. And I said, you know, the transition was supposed to uh, figure out how to accomplish every one of the promises he made. I think that's really good on my issues, energy and environment. I'm, I'm worried about his promises on trade. So uh, to, to now finally answer your question to the best of my ability, I think that uh, negotiating a uh, a trade agreement with the United States and the United Kingdom, now that the United Kingdom is pulling out of the, the European Union, uh, could be a, a very good thing if it, if it lowered trade barriers and increased trade and that the Trump administration could see how economically beneficial that was. And it would, of course, be good for both countries to lower trade barriers. So, uh, so something good could come out of, of, of Brexit in, in terms of educating uh, the Trump administration as to the benefits of, of freer trade. Hold on. I'm Elaine Mills from Argus Media. Um, I was just wondering, you said that uh, you believe Trump should undo the endangerment finding of the Supreme Court. How would he go about doing this? Um, and I'm also curious, when you say you believe that science, this, um, the climate sensitivity of greenhouse gases has been over-exaggerated yes. and the benefits of hydrocarbons under-stated. Um, what is the motivation of people doing that? Why would people do that? Um, well, to answer your second question first, um, you know, everybody looked at from some perspective as a special interest. 
And the climate industrial complex is a gigantic special interest that involves uh, everyone from uh, the producers of higher priced energy to the academics who benefit from uh, advancement in their careers and larger government grants. Uh, there's a wide range of people who belong to the climate industrial complex and they, they, they constitute, uh, to my mind, a very uh, uh, dangerous special interest. Now, how about the endangerment finding? The Supreme Court did not make the endangerment finding. The EPA made it as a result of the Supreme Court decision. Uh, and they could have made it differently, and they could have decided not to make it at all. So uh, the way you undo a, a regulation in the United States regulatory system is under the Administrative Procedures Act of 1947, you, you undo a regulation pretty much the same way you made it. You reopen the regulation, you, uh, you have a, a public notice and comment, you take account of all the public uh, comment, and you then uh, make it a different determination. You publish that in the Federal Register, and then people sue, you, sue the agency to try to block your decision. So there's a huge amount of, of litigation against the, the, the greenhouse gas emission rules. Uh, CEI is a plaintiff, one of, I think, 158 plaintiffs, or I may, I may be making that number up, but it's a huge number of plaintiffs, including 28 states. Uh, opposing the so-called Clean Power Plan, and my, my organization is one of those plaintiffs. Uh, but once, if, if it goes the other way, then uh, very many environmental <coughs> groups in many states like California uh, and New York will become plaintiffs to try to block the overturning of, of the endangerment finding. So it's a, it's a drawn out process. The other way to undo a regulation is for Congress to, to, to intervene and say, uh, we, we hereby strike this regulation. So, and there are various methods to do that, but uh, they, they require the signature of the president. And in this case, of course, the Congress sent the president a bill that contained language striking the power plant rules or the clean or the endangerment finding. Uh, president Trump would, of course, sign those. So those are, those are the two ways you can do it. Hi, I'm, I'm Beacon Air from Responsible Investor. And from what you've said about the US's energy policy, what's the message for institutional investors who are increasingly looking at investing in low carbon solutions? For example, there was a French sovereign bond last week which attracted about 8 billion in investment and it had 23 billion of interest, but the US seems to be going the other way. Well, uh, you know, I'm not an investment guru, so. I think I'll pass on that question except to say, uh, uh, you know, I think investors are clearly looking, as you are, looking very closely at what the U.S. administration may do and what they, that may mean for investment. I mean, my view is um, the, the federal government in the United States, uh, and the EPA in particular, needs to refocus its efforts on protecting the environment. Uh, and to stop supporting the climate industrial complex with taxpayer dollars. That's my view, and I think obviously if, if that is pursued by the federal government, it will have an impact on what people think they can make money in investing in. Yes. yes. Um, hi, Nina Chesney from Reuters. And um, just to go back to the trade uh, discussion, um, Obviously, at Marrakesh last year at the UN climate talks, um, Trump was very much a topic there. Yeah, I, um, I heard that. I, I'm sorry I wasn't there. I was, um, I was planning to go until I got my job in the transition. And there was quite a lot of talk about um, the possibility of if the US withdrew from the Paris Agreement, there would be some kind of trade implications and consequences of that. So I'm just worried, wondered if there's a concern about that kind of a backlash from the international community in that way? The French have also raised the issue that they might enforce some tariffs on American products if Trump were to move out of Paris. 
Well, of course, President Trump wants to impose some tariffs on, <laughs> on imported goods to the United States. So, I, you know, if we want to provoke a trade war and, and put the entire global economy into depression, then, uh, yeah, I, I, I encourage both President Trump and the French to go forward th with these crazy ideas. But I certainly have, uh, wouldn't support anything like that. Yes, please. On trade as well, um, you mentioned that in a U.S.-U.K. trade agreement that you want to see some trade barriers removed, and I was wondering if you had any sort of examples of the kind of barriers you're talking about. No, I, I, I sort of gave up on trade policy a long time ago. I, I think, I mean, I, 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 I'm not do, I haven't done it for a long time. I used to do international trade policy from the standpoint of how do we keep out the environmental and labor side agreements. Uh, which the United States has insisted upon in every trade agreement. And of course, I lost that battle com conclusively, and so I, I got out of trade policy. So I don't know, but look, there are a lot of trade barriers, there are a lot of barriers to free trade in the world. And if, if, if Brexit could precipitate a new agreement with the United States and the United Kingdom uh, that would lower some of the trade barriers between the two countries, I think that would be great. But I don't, I don't know what the Trump administration's position on that is, so I, you know, have no idea. Hi, Lindsay Dodson from Business Insider UK. Um, is it the general opinion of the Trump administration that it's appropriate for the EPA to host scientific data about climate change on its website? And if so, or if not, was this discussed during the transition? Um, well, uh, uh, yeah, there, there have been all these scare stories put forward by various people and groups that somehow the Trump administration is going to suppress or destroy data. Uh, I have absolutely no evidence that anyone connected to the campaign or the transition has any interest in doing that. And in fact, the main problem CEI uh, has been very active in uh, using the Freedom of Information Act to uh, reveal uh, information from the EPA. And it turns out uh, that the Obama administration, which uh, President Obama said when he was first elected that it would be the most transparent administration in history, the Society of Environmental Journalists uh, a couple of years ago said that this is the most secretive administration in history and they have tried to conceal uh, all kinds of things. And in my experience at CEI is that, uh, you know, they do not comply with the Freedom of Information Act. They, uh, we have to go to court to make them comply. And then once the court has made them comply, it often turns out that they have destroyed the records that have been uh, requested. So. The, the Obama administration has a, a absolutely disgraceful record on uh, trying to conceal information that should be available to the public. Uh, they have a disgraceful record on destroying information in order to but pages avoid. But have disappeared under this transition from the EPA's website. Yes, uh, and I think that that is appropriate because those uh, those pages are they're still available. They're just not. Uh, the, the information on those pages is still available. Uh, everything has been archived, but they are not what you see when you open up the EPA. And uh, one of the, the problems, I think, with a lot of what the EPA promulgates as environmental information does, is, does not actually meet the minimal standards required by the Federal Information Quality Act, uh, the, which was passed in 1999 in order to try to improve the the dissemination and use of information by the federal government, including scientific data. A lot of what the federal government uh, disseminates it does not meet those minimal standards, and the Obama administration uh, just simply dropped enforcing or trying to enforce the Information Quality Act. I, it's my hope that the Trump administration will have an administration-wide policy to take the Information Quality Act very seriously and to demand that any information used or disseminated by the, by the federal government meets the minimal standards of the Information Quality Act. Thank you. William Powell from Natural Gas World. Do you see the new administration having any effect on the rate at which FERC gives about its business? I think particularly of permitting uh, export terminals for LNG. Uh, I'm certain that it will because I think, as you know, uh, the federal 
Energy Regulatory Commission uh, is now down to, to two commissioners. And so they can't actually make any decisions. Uh, I think they have to have, I think the full commission is five, is that correct? Uh, and so they, they can't make decisions unless they have at least three members. They don't have that. So, so President Trump will be nominating some people, I imagine, very quickly. And so the, the political makeup of, of FERC will change dramatically as soon as he makes it. And I think it was uh, one of his uh, oft-repeated campaign promises on energy that he was going to uh, expedite the building of the necessary infrastructure for natural gas. That includes pipelines and it includes permitting those terminals. So I expect to see very quick action on that. Now, I wasn't involved in, in, the, in the Department of Energy team, so I'm, I'm not giving away any inside information because I don't have any. I just think that given the way the campaign went and what he said, you will see very quick executive action to uh, expedite LNG terminals and, and pipelines. Roger. So, uh, can you just, Roger Harriman, we yes. met uh, many years ago when I think yes. you were saying at that time, about 15 years ago, that there was no proof that humans were involved in climate change at all, and you were very much opposing uh, subsidies for wind and solar, which you now admit are cost competitive in the right places. But that's kind of just by way of background, really. I want to ask you um, a couple of questions about, I guess, what you might call the fossil fuel industrial complex. So under the last administration, the car firms virtually bankrupted themselves because they were so successful in opposing new regulations that they were so uh, fuel inefficient that they were being outcompeted. And Obama bailed them out and set new standards on them. They're now trying to undo those standards again. I wonder what your view is on that. And also on our electricity rates, I, I heard you talk about you know uh, high energy prices in the, in the USA. The, the last study I saw on this showed the USA having some of the very lowest energy prices in the world. And uh, the, the energy was no longer a competitive issue against China, for, for instance. So I suspect there's a bit of a, a myth here. And I wonder if you could tackle both those, the cars and the low prices myth, or high prices myth. Well, I think you have... Uh misstated or misunderstood the history of the bankruptcy of the auto industry. Um, the auto industry in the U.S. Uh, went into crisis after the Wall Street panic and the Wall Street bailout of 2008, uh, and people stopped buying cars. So. They particularly stopped buying American cars because no, American no, they cars stopped. They stopped buying. They stopped. They stopped buying cars. Now, uh, the fact is that uh, because of low uh, petrol prices, uh, which now look to be uh, low for as far as the eye can see, and again, I don't like to predict the future, but consumers are predicting the future by buying uh, large pickup trucks and SUVs and high-performance automobiles. So. Uh, the, if you look at the profit uh, sectors of, uh, of, of every major auto producer, it's at the high end and the low uh, fuel economy end. The, the, uh, the fuel economy standards are raising the prices of automobiles. And unfortunately, it looks like they're raising the prices of automobiles far beyond, far higher than consumers will ever get back in terms of fuel savings. Uh, so uh, I, think, I think you misstated that. Now, in terms of electric rates, um, I said uh, two things that I believe are true, and I, I don't see what you've said really affects them. Uh, yes, the US has very low electric rates on average, but they're extremely low in the manufacturing states, the energy intensive states, the states that have high resource production. And they're high in the states that don't, New York, California, New England. These used to be manufacturing centers. And in fact, California used to be a major resource producer, but that's gone by the wayside. California's electric rates are about twice the national average. And they're uh, getting close to three times the rates in the lowest electric rate states. You said that wasn't relevant because the coast didn't need low electricity rates. You talked about the center needing low electricity rates, and you just admitted that's exactly where they are, though. 
Well, they are low because those states and the federal government have not implemented the energy rationing policies that have caused electric rates to skyrocket in California, the United Kingdom, Germany, and so on. If you, if you enact those policies the way California has or the way the Regional Greenhouse Gas Initiative has in the Northeast, you're going to get higher electric rates. That's just a fact. Now, if you don't think that you need manufactured goods or you don't need resources like minerals and, and uh, uh, food and timber, if you think you can live without those, then let's make the entire world into a very high uh, energy cost world. But the fact is that whenever electric rates go up in one part of the world, uh, the economic activity that is energy intensive moves to another part of the world. That's just inevitable. Thank you, Matt Hope from DSMOG UK. Um, you said that science has been, been rejected and experts have been rejected, and you said there's good reasons for that. If that's the case and you've rejected both those groups, where do you get your, your information from? And then linked to that, you said that if you look at anyone in a particular way, they're a special interest, uh, in which case, which special interest is currently in the White House and what special interest are you linked to and representing today? Yes. Um, uh, the Competitive Enterprise Institute uh, represents a very particular viewpoint about the role of government and the role of regulation in our lives. And in general, we support uh, less regulation, freer markets, and more freedom for people to make decisions about their lives. Uh, so our special interest is, I would say, freedom. Uh, the, the enemies of freedom come in many guises, and one of the most insidious and dangerous in the modern world is the regulatory regime that we now uh, uh, suffer under, both in, in this country and in the European Union and in the United States. And uh, a large part of that is due to the environmental movement, which in my view is the greatest threat to freedom and prosperity in, in the modern world. So. Uh, now, uh, who does President Trump represent? Well, you know, he said he wants to be a president for all the people, but that he is against the elites. And uh, as, as I have described the expertariat, uh, yes, I get my information from experts, but I, I tend to be very skeptical of the expert opinion when it becomes a sort of um, a group think. And that, that all the experts gang up together against the interests of the country or of, or of its people. And I think we see, uh, I think that the Brexit vote was an indication that the British people uh, don't accept the group think provided by the, uh, provided by London, uh, to, to be, uh, just to give it a, a shorthand name. And in the United States, I think that the election both of President Trump and of massive majorities of Republicans across the heartland states is a rejection of the expertariat. And I, I would just mention that there are more Republican, as a result of eight years of President Obama, there are now more Republican state legislators than there ever have been in history. Ben. Yeah. And there's somebody way back there. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oliver. Yeah. 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 Just a quick one. Uh, how close is uh, Trump's view of climate change to your view of climate change? I have no idea. I mean, how, how could I? I mean, he said three or four things, and I've been reading scientific articles for 20 years or more. How so many times I, have you I, met him? I've never met him. You've never met him? Who have you met? <laughs> I don't mean generally. You know, <laughs> <laughs> you know, I mean, you haven't been invited to the palace yet. <laughs> <laughs> Who have you met? How does oh, it work? We don't know where he's. It's all very mysterious. How does it work? Uh, is that a question? Yeah, you, you were officially head of the transition team on the environment. Is that yeah. correct? On the Environmental Protection Agency. Okay, on EPA. So who appointed you? And who did you speak to to kind of work out what you wanted to do? Um, the internal workings of the transition are confidential. And uh, I would say I was invited in late August to become the leader of the EPA team, uh, and I accepted that. By uh, the Trump team? By the Trump transition, uh, which was headed at that time by Governor Christie. 
uh, and uh, I worked uh, under the various uh, leaders of the transition, and I recruited a team of uh, colleagues to do the, the uh, plans for the EPA. Did you then, did you then advise? Uh, Roger, you can I just, speaking? you've had, I think, no, enough. These are all quite important things, aren't they? Well, well everyone thinks that they are important. <laughs> um, Pilita and then Oliver. Actually, I am quite interested. I'm uh, sorry, Felicia Clark, Financial Times. Oh, yes, yes. Me too. Um, I, I would like to hear the answer to Roger's question first before I ask mine. Right. Uh, as long as you don't ask your, as long as you don't ask your question. I mean, you get a question. Is she? Surely not. It's a trainer. No, we're we're running out of time here, and there's still people. In fact, we're at an hour. So yes, we'll but, have. Let's do these two questions. And, and there was somebody Oliver. in back. Yeah, Oliver. Oh, yeah, Just, uh, sorry, I'll more the contact. Uh, two, two, two questions um, on stuff we haven't touched on. One was, how do you foresee the future of the, of the Endangered Species Act over the next four years? I know it's not EPA, but I thought you might have an opinion. And also, in your work on the transition, um, uh, content as it might be, do you have any, uh, did you have any discussions about the support for lack of uh, support for geoengineering research? Uh, the Endangered Species Act has been a, a great uh, issue in the United States and an interest of mine since uh, about 1990, and I've been working to reform it uh, so far without any success at all. Uh, and the Endangered Species Act uh, doesn't do much to protect endangered wildlife, but it does a huge amount to uh, uh, control private property owners' land use. Uh, and it's, it's enforced very selectively so that some landowners are not affected, but people with exactly the same habitat, uh, are their, their use is, is limited or eliminated. So it's a political weapon, and I'm very interested in reforming it, and uh, I don't know if we will see that any time in the next decade, but I hope so. Uh, now, geoengineering, uh, of course, this is something that keeps coming up. Um, I don't, uh, look, I, I said this at the beginning and I'll say it again. Uh, my charge as, and I think this, this was the charge of every uh, leader of, a, of an agency team in the transition, was to develop a plan, an, an advisory plan, for implementing the promises President Trump made during the campaign. Uh, I don't think he made any promises about investigating or pursuing geoengineering. Okay, last question and then we... And I can, I can talk informally uh, for a while. Uh, for yeah, a there are afterwards. a few one-to-one yes. -one interviews afterwards. Last question. Brian uh, Analyst, um, how do you see Trump's climate change policies affecting the secondary? policies like smart growth, brown fuel revitalization, and some new buildings, because a lot of them are job related and climate related as well. So right. There's an awful lot of money going into brown fuel revitalization. How do you see that going? Uh, well, I, I don't think I can answer the question specifically because I don't know, but I would say that it, it, uh, President Trump made clear during the campaign, he said he wants to abolish the EPA, but he said the part of the EPA he likes and wants to continue and perhaps even increase is the pass-through grants to the states to, uh, to undertake various forms of environmental protection. So the, the EPA has a budget of about a little more than $8 billion a year, and about half of that already goes to, to state grants to do things like infrastructure projects, cleanup, uh, these kinds of things. So I think that's, uh, his interest really is, is that, um, the EPA go back to its core missions, and, and most of the core missions of the EPA have been devolved to the states. And therefore, I think it's quite appropriate that the federal government continue to fund through grants these, these, uh, these infrastructure and cleanup activities. So I, I would expect, you know, that in, in terms of his, his desire to radically shrink the, uh, the EPA's bureaucracy, uh, you may actually see more money going into state grants. I mean, that's just a guess, but I think it's possible. Thank you very much. Uh, I hope you uh, have a better idea <laughs> of what's going to happen. I think we uh, have to um, just 
wonder what will happen today and tomorrow. <laughs> um, but I think Myron has given you some ideas of what kind of thinking is going on in Washington, and we'll just have to watch the space. Thank, Thank you, you for coming. Thank you. Thank you, Danny. Thank you, Danny.